Welcome to Hemp Foundation Talks, where we listen to the heartbeats of the hemp industry and learn the celebrations, challenges, and discoveries from hemp leaders and advocates from around the world. I'm Rebecca, International Business Officer with the Hemp Foundation and your host. Today's guest is Marcy Zaroff. Marcy Zaroff coined the term Echo Fashion in 1995 and is an internationally recognized eco lifestyle expert, educator, innovator, serial entrepreneur and author of Echo Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy, and sustainable world. Founder and CEO of God's Global Organic Textile Standard, certified Echo Fashion Corp, a greenhouse of brands, including B2B Turnkey, sustainable fa fashion manufacturer Metaware, regenerative organic cotton farm project Reset, QVC affordable organic lifestyle brands, Farm to Home and Seed to Style, and D2C organic fashion brand Yes And. Also founder of Under the Canopy, producer of Thread Documentary, Driving Fashion Forward, and co-founder of Good Catch, Beyond Brands, and the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. From food to fiber, Marcy has been instrumental in driving authenticity, environmental leadership, and social justice worldwide for over three decades. Board member of the Textile Exchange and Organic Center of the Organic Trade Association, global keynote speaker, and recipient of countless awards. Marcy is also featured in the book, Echo Amazons, 20 Women Who Are Transforming the World and is a Henry Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute. Marcy, you have been such a catalyst in the sustainability space for years and very successful at launching many businesses that are earth friendly. I particularly admire what you've done to bring transparency um, to the marketplace from visiting the farmers and working in India to bring these products into the marketplace and inspiring consumers to live more of an eco lifestyle. And I just wanna first say thank you. <laughs> thank you for the work that you've done that has paved the way and brought greater awareness for us to live in better harmony with our environment. And um, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. And I just wanna start off with, if you can share with our audience um, what inspired your drive and passion to introduce Echo Fashion into the mainstream? Like, what is your why? Yeah, well, I started my career actually in the food space. Um, and, you know, kind of in the name of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Your first basic need is food. And I, I really came into it because I myself discovered eating a more conscious lifestyle made a big difference in the way I felt and, you know, feeling more responsible to, you know, the world around me. And I think that sort of experience and sort of being in the trenches of the organic food movement back in the day when everybody knew each other um, was the, the starting point. But just like many people, once you sort of integrate you know, mindful, you know, eating and what you put in your body, there's sort of a natural progression to like, yeah. what's next? What more? What yeah. else? And so we've started to wake up to the fact that this is a lifestyle. This is a way of thinking and that you can't really support one part of the equation without the other, because at right. the end of the day, food and fiber are growing together in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So when I discovered that cotton was one of the most heavily sprayed industries in agriculture and that 60% of a cotton plant goes, went back into the food stream. And then similarly with hemp, as I learned about the history of hemp and the fact that, you know, in the 1800s, almost 80% of our, our textiles were made of hemp, you know, I, I started to dive deeper into the textile and fiber side of the equation. And in, in 1995, I coined and trademarked the term eco fashion to really revolutionize the fashion industry through education, inspiration, innovation, and collaboration, which not just collaboration within our industry, but with the food system, telling right. the story together and connecting the dots from food to fiber. And again, going back to Maslow hierarchy, the next basic need is shelter and clothing. So that sort of evolution from agriculture to popular culture mm -hmm. became sort of my life work. And I call myself a soil junkie <laughs> because being in agriculture with the farmers at the source where it all starts is like my happy place. It's yeah. the DNA of my life work. Yeah. But you make a very good point because that's kind of how I see it too, as far as the soil of our bodies and the soil of our earth is very much connected. And when we can get um, healthier soil, then we can live healthier in, in our own bodies individually and then within communities. So um, I yeah. think that's, that's so very important. Um, and 
I know that you have done a lot of work in organic cotton. Um, can you tell me more about that process and any other sustainable practices and materials that you've incorporated into your brands? Maybe a little bit of the, you know, on the ground, dirty details. <laughs> yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, when you when you talk about kind of the healthy soil makes healthy plants, makes healthy people. That philosophy, which really kind of came out of the Rodale Institute in terms of how they did the science and the studies of organic in America, they really are kind of credited for coining the term organic in America. And, you know, when I started to like understand sort of that whole interconnection, and, and as I mentioned, 60% of a cotton plant goes back to the food stream for feed for dairy and cottonseed oil for breads and snack products. You know, I sort of had this like, wait a minute, why aren't people, you know, more conscious of, of cotton and, you know, pulling the curtain back and unveiling the human and environmental impacts of cotton led me to, you know, partnering with the Rodales actually back in the day to get into the trenches and start talking to farmers about wait a minute, if we're, you know, talking about organic food and, and cotton is an important crop in the rotation because there's a lot of nutrients in the cotton plant that can actually feed the soil. Mm -hmm. And as we talk about building healthy soil, it really comes down to, you know, crop rotation, intercropping, green manure, cover cropping, all the regenerative principles that are going to build soil health and biodiversity and ultimately a thriving environment in the soil that's going to capture carbon out of the atmosphere. So my sure. first frontier was, you know, kind of a, a almost a two-pronged approach. I went to India back in the 90s to start learning about what was going on around the early stage organic movement there and started meeting with people to figure out how do I do this with textiles. And similarly, I was doing the same thing in the U.S. There's a, an organic cotton farmer co-op in Texas called um, the Texas Organic Cotton Marketing Co-op, TACMAC. And so they were also growing organic cotton. And so looking at how could I build supply chains from the ground up, mm -hmm. which was always very different than the way that the fashion and textile industry historically operated, which was source out a factory and let the factory build down the supply chain. Because, you know, a garment can change hands seven to 10 times in the supply chain, from the farm to the gin, to spinning, to either knitting or weaving, depending on if you're doing knits or wovens, to cutting, sewing, dyeing, to then printing, finishing, embroidery, then packaging and transportation, like so many hands touch a garment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, building a supply chain from farm to finished fashion allowed for me to understand the process and right out of the gate, build based on a transparency model where I could elevate farmers tell their stories and celebrate the work they're doing because ultimately when they speak about their work, it really comes from the seed. That's where it right. starts. And the seed represents life. So for me, it's like water for chocolate. How do you take that energy of the seed and the representative of a healthy life starting there and bring it all the way up to fashion, which, you know, a third of the world's textiles are made from cotton. Right. So, you know, we all touch cotton in our sheets and our towels and our robes, but also our denim and our T-shirts and our dresses and our jackets and everything. So how do we leverage the power of fashion to truly drive the expansion of organic and regenerative agriculture has always been a very core part of my life work. Right. And when you talk about the, the regenerative agriculture and, and the importance of crop cycling and, and things like that, and like, how do we get to a better uh, situation right now where, so cotton is running it, right? So how do we integrate other things that are uh, more natural and, and doing that regenerative um, cycling things? And tell me more, do you have plans to, you know, add other materials and maybe hemp yeah. into your, your fashion lines? Absolutely. Um, in fact, um, you know, the hemp fiber movement is one of the fastest growing sectors of, of hemp right now. And I would say, you know, I'm very excited. I just, as you know, spoke at a uh, NOCO at the hemp conference in Colorado last week and um, gave you guys some love. Yes, and, um, thank you. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I am really excited because when I started my career, you know, hemp was one of my core fabrics at Under the Canopy, which was my first brand, right? Yeah. Under the Canopy, the concept was we all live under the canopy of the planet's ecosystem together. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, kind of in the name of the Native Americans, right? Like 
The canopy is the ozone layer, which protects life in future generations. And in the right. rainforest, the canopy is the top layer with all the ecosystem under it and all that life. So hemp was a big part of that model, but I was importing it from Canada or from China. And my, my challenge with hemp was kind of twofold back then. One was the processing of hemp was heavily chemically driven, mm -hmm. right? To, you know, all the different processing of taking the fiber and turning it into yarn was a very heavy chemical process. The second piece was the single most greatest question I got asked was, can you smoke it after you wear it? You know, there was a lot of stigma around yeah. hemp back in the 90s where, you know, the per perception was potato sack, you know, right. crunchy crunchy, frumpy, boxy, beige, boring, you know, that was the stigma with hemp. Yeah. So in order for me to build the eco-fashion movement effectively, I had to either blend hemp, which I did with like tensile ISL or organic cotton or organic peace silks, you know, anything that could soften the fiber in the yarn form or the, or the fabric form so that it had a nicer hand. Today, yeah. there's a lot of innovation around hemp in terms of processing and companies that are finding ways to process hemp without using all the heavy chemicals. So that's one big breakthrough. Yes. The second is when you talk about new fibers and materials, whether it's, you know, again, the tensile lyocell and other cellulosic fibers, extracting those from, you know, other plant sources or the biomaterial market, you know, there's a lot of new innovation around banana, pineapple, mushroom, right. you know, like all kinds of proliferation of food waste. And then you've got, you know, organic cotton and regenerative cotton, which obviously is always core to blending with hemp. So yes, there's sort of two things happening on the fiber material side, we're re-exploring hemp again. Mm -hmm. And then on the manufacturing side, I'm working right now on opening a factory of the future in Louisiana in 2023 or awesome. early 24 that will be built on a hemp campus. So we will be one division of the hemp campus, the fiber and textile manufacturing arm, mm -hmm. but there will be the whole vertical supply chain and other categories will be all part of this ecosystem. And it's called Renaissance, this project. And uh, we're working on it and with a strategic partner. So I'm very excited and it's bringing me back full circle. Yeah. Again, the Renaissance is a rebirth. And my book is called Eco Renaissance because it's really about through the lens of design, we can change the world. If we lead with, you know, style and quality and fit yeah. and color and comfort and then oh by the way it's also a solution to climate change right. it's you know ethically made it's certified organic or regenerative it's circular it's biodegradable it's all that yummy stuff and in the case of hemp you know it's a the bioremediation and the mm -hmm. fact that it's half the amount of land to grow but larger yields and half the amount of water than cotton. And there's all these benefits, of course, the UVA and UVB resistance. And there's just so many great, you know, great storytelling talking yeah. points. And today, you know, all brands and retailers are sort of getting on the, the train of making these sort of carbon net zero or climate change, you know, science-based target commitments. And they're looking for solutions. And yeah. hemp is going to be right there at the forefront to be one of those solutions. And so I'm really trying to, you know, cultivate that um, right. <laughs> uh, along the way. That's that's totally amazing. And um, even to know that you're doing this in, in the States as well, I think, because U.S. is one of the, you know, biggest contributors, I think, to, to our fast fashion um, and such. So um, I, I look forward to seeing it more of a normal thing that everybody wears, you know, um, and is conscious of eco fashion. Um, yeah. So tell me a little bit more, like from your experience and your successes with organic cotton and now, you know, merging more of hemp into the supply chain. Like, where do you see that the supply chain needs improvement when it comes to transparency um, and living in better harmony with our environment, and then including with hemp. So, you know, you've kind of worked on that chain really well with, with cotton, but what about the chain through hemp? Where are we at right now? And where do you think there needs to be improvements? Yeah. So 
there's sort of two arms to the work I'm doing. One is in India and one is in the US. So in India, which I when in discovering, you know, what the work you guys are doing, it's it's exciting because, you know, the we're at the like infancy of hemp in India. And and we have a project down in southern India that's toying with hemp. We have a pro, uh, a partner, a strategic partner that's building a multi-million dollar processing plant in the Mumbai area nice. that is also going to be working with hemp. They're doing a lot of R&D right now around hemp as well as banana fiber, mm -hmm. which has a similar bast fiber um, that has to be broken down. So they're working on a, you know, on a non-chemical processing solution. Um, so in India, we've got the beginning stages of how to take the fiber once it's harvested and through, you know, all of the decortication process and uh, the reading and all the processes to get to a place where we can spin yarn that's going to be, you know, tested and very usable in fashion and textiles, mm -hmm. but without, again, the historic, you know, use of all the chemicals. The second piece is in the U.S., a similar track is happening, except because hemp, and since the Farm Bill passed, is now sort of front and center in the minds and the eyes of, you know, even uh, a, an economic development solution. Right. Um, you know, everybody's talking about it from what breed should we be growing? Mm -hmm. What, where should we be growing? I mean, hemp can grow pretty much anywhere. So it's right. how to best grow it for commercialization. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're in the early stages of seeing that kind of come back to life where there's a lot of testing and companies trying to figure out which are the best, you know, plants to, to really build on. At the same time, we have our first manufacturing facility um, that is hopefully going to open this year called Panda, which I'm sure you're familiar with in, in Texas. There's a couple others right behind them that are doing um, development and setting up the machinery um, so that we will have processing. And then with our factory, which will be in Louisiana, eventually it will be a fully vertically integrated factory. But out of the gate, we'll be leveraging some of these partnerships to get, you know, hemp to a finished form where then obviously it can be spun to then be knit or woven into fabric. So, right. you know, it's a lot of layers and a lot of complexities, but because I've been through it with cotton, to your point, I kind of know what needs to happen. It's just yeah. a question of catching up on the innovation because we're not there yet. And the systems in this country are completely broken for manufacturing. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons, and this is no different for hemp than as it is for cotton, the supply chains, you know, have been so broken ever since offshore manufacturing left the U.S. and went offshore. Mm -hmm. And so even the ones that are still standing are very dated. And only now since COVID are they starting to invest into state-of-the-art equipment because there's been proven demand based on the fact that risk mitigation most companies were heavily dependent on producing overseas. And now, you know, this kind of resurgence of onshore demand is really based on everybody wants to have a stake in the U.S. market now to not be dependent 100 percent on offshore production. So right. that sort of catalyst of the pandemic has been twofold, one being onshoring and one being an increased awareness around sustainability and health and wellness and carbon and climate change, you know, solutions and climate action. And, you know, everybody's talking about this now, unlike ever before. So I think that's the, you know, the black and the white, the yin and the yang or the gift of COVID, you know, right. obviously there was a dark side, but the light in the tunnel is, you know, that that it has spurred a lot of new innovation and, and a whole new wave of thinking for both the consumer as well as business. Right. And I think it is very important to have that um, global perspective because we're all living on this planet together, right? And so how do we work together and use the strengths of, of India and their richness and history of textiles to, to um, helping the marginalized of society and 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 which has been you probably know historically the farmers and and what happened with cotton and and all the gmo and and how it really damaged um the livelihood of those farmers having that introduction so how do we be responsible you know to um help heal that um and which i think what where we're going right now um but um I think I just really like that perspective that you have and how we, I think we need to, where is, I guess, that balance between, you know, global and domestic? 
Yeah. Well, I'm, I, you know, I think it needs to be both, right? Like I think um, to your point, you know, we're all in this together. We're a global community. I mean, the movie Don't Look Up, I think was a very profound film for people to realize like, this isn't like a, a by, this isn't a, a partisan issue in our country. Mm -hmm. This is like, we're all sharing this home together, you know, exactly. hashtag love our mother, right? You right. know, and one of those kind of quotes from Native American philosophy that always inspired me is, we don't inherit this land from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Yes. And as the mother of, you know, five um, millennials, essentially, or Gen X, Gen Y. No Gen way, you have five? Uh, well, I have two and three by <laughs> marriage, so I have five. Oh. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you, you still know, look like, young and vibrant because of, <laughs> of healthy you. practices, right? <laughs> it is. That's the name of the game. But, um, you know, and whether it's women's empowerment or it's understanding, you know, the energy of the products that, that we're creating that are an extension of ourselves. And right. that really comes back to we're all in this together, win, win, win. And the people across the world, one of the reasons I'm very passionate about working in India, and, you know, you mentioned cotton is, you know, in 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 India, you hear statistics, you know, every half an hour, a conventional cotton farmer is committing suicide yeah. because they're stuck on the pesticide treadmill. It's right. not sustainable to perpetuate this chemical, you know, reel of just going on and on and on. They're like, a, you know, um, they have to keep investing further because the bugs build resistance. It right. further depletes and destroys the soil. The soil gets weaker. The chemicals get stronger. And we get further out of balance <laughs> right. the more and that we use it. And the banks are partnered with the seed and chemical companies. So, you know, the farmers go in despair. They end up drinking the pesticides and committing suicide. Yeah. So the social ramifications really are just as intense and, and horrific as the environmental ramifications of all the sprays and the most carcinogenic sprays in agriculture end up on cotton because the perception is we're not putting it in our bodies. We're putting it on, so who cares? But, you know, the skin is the largest organ in our bodies. It's the mm -hmm. primary organ for absorption. So what we put on our bodies is just as much, you know, it, it's just as important. Plus the air and the water, of course, the runoff, the right. soil health compromise. Um, so there's so many reasons that we can emulate now in terms of as we grow hemp. One thing that is so critically important is that we focus on it staying organic. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we right. can grow hemp with all, without all the chemicals. So let's not move it into a chemical based system as yes. cotton went because cotton at one point in time was a natural system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but now we're in this sort of moral dilemma where there's so many people jumping on the bandwagon and they want the easy, you know, fast route. They think that's the solution. But we need to kind of right out of the gate. And Matt Dwyer from Patagonia said, let hindsight be foresight. Right. Let's not let's learn from the cotton industry right. and apply that mindset. Let's not retrofit now co conventional, chemically ridden cotton to organic. And let's not take the same mindset and do that with hemp. Let's come out of the gate with certified organic hemp. So big opportunity, yeah. um, you know, for the consumer, too, which right. is what they want. So um, kind of uh, maybe just to wrap up with with another question and, and maybe you can give some motivation um, to other people, you know, that are starting up in the industry, um, and well, two two things actually I want to ask. <laughs> so, one one is, you know, what is your future vision for Echo Fashion in the next, you know, five to ten years? What what do you imagine is like a utopian, you know, type of future um, where we're heading? And and then also, what can you give inspiration for others who are um, you know, entrepreneurs in this space and trying to um, do good for our earth and to create more harmony through the marketplace and um, and the whole the whole chain. <laughs> yeah. So on the okay. So my my vision has really been the same for over thirty years, which is to make the norm the alternative. Yes. And the alternative the norm. So when we're reading labels, it's a given that the cotton is organic or regenerative, that the polyester is recycled poly, that the, you know, that the fibers, it's hemp, that is hopefully organic, that the, the bio, you know, the, the cellulosics are not taking down old forestry, you know? Um, and so I think as we start to hold our industry more accountable, yes. 
You know, it's not about staying ahead anymore. It's about not being left behind. And when you see today, 82% of Americans are buying organic food, at least occasionally. And Costco is the biggest buyer in America of organic yeah. food. You can see we finally have crossed over where, you know, when I started my career, everybody in the organic industry, probably globally, knew each other. That's mm -hmm. how small the industry was because organic was like this niche concept, but it's crossed over now where every supermarket, every multinational brand, every food company is looking at how can they, you know, source organic ingredients or go all the way to the end game and be a certified organic product or brand or even retailer. Yeah. So I think what we're going to see in, in the way of textiles is as we are now seeing beauty take root and all the CVSs and Walgreens and Dwayne Reeds of the world, Targets, Walmarts, they're clearing their shelves for clean beauty. But the founder of Aveda was my mentor of 25 years. And I watched his struggle as he tried to revolutionize the personal care industry. Mm -hmm. So I think the next frontier for us is this kind of connecting of the dots now to textiles where people are asking, who made my clothes? What's yes. in them? Where are they being made? And the fashion revolution movement has been an incredible catalyst to make people think about, you know, those questions. And, and our whole model at Eco Fashion Corp and MetaWare is to connect source to story, mm -hmm. right? So that we can digitize and verify that whole traceability so that we can engage consumers to go on that journey with us. And with that, the segue over to what, what I tell future entrepreneurs is enjoy the journey. It's about the journey, not the destination, right? Mm -hmm. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step, right? Lao Tzu. So take one step at a time. And if you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem, right? So, you know, as Albert Einstein said, we can't solve today's problems with the same consciousness that created them. Right. So let's all be a part of the solution and re recognize that you have to put your seatbelt on as an entrepreneur. And when you go on that journey, know it's never a straight line up. There are lots of twists and turns. It's like a roller coaster ride. Lots of ups and downs. Lots of, you know, you're going to get flipped upside down. But enjoy the ride and keep going. Set vision, but don't get stuck on how you're going to get there. Be willing and ready to pivot at all times and see all challenges as opportunities yes. to learn and get smarter and stronger along the way. Don't get paralyzed by them. Don't get stuck in the muck. Yes. Thank you so much, Marcy. Appreciate your words of wisdom and thank you for, for what you're doing for the industry. And I'm so excited to see what's to come. <laughs> thank you so much. And, you know, remember one plus one equals 11. We're all stronger together than apart and we can eat the change and we can drink the change and we can be the change <laughs> and we can wear the change we yes. wish to see in the world. So yes. looking forward to it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you for listening to Hemp Foundation Talks. Hemp Foundation is a nonprofit social enterprise on a mission to provide solutions for our current ecological crisis. Hemp Foundation and their brand, Uki, has created a value chain from village farms to the marketplace. Utilizing the many benefits of hemp to overcome deforestation, fight plastic pollution, and support regenerative practices to heal our earth. The foundation supports over 250 small village farmers in the Indian Himalayan region. In addition, they employ widows and women in the production of over 500 hemp products for the marketplace. From clothing, to food, to hemp bags, a large range of textiles, embroidered fabrics, home goods, and even hemp bioplastic. To learn more, visit hempfoundation.net.